Good morning and welcome to another episode of Saturday Morning with Sam. I am Sam Gaylord, Managing Partner at Gaylord Pop and Disability Litigator in the state of New Jersey, representing injured workers in the areas of workers' compensation, social security disability, and disability pension appeals. And I want to say good morning and welcome to uh, the 79th episode of Saturday Morning with Sam. Uh, that's not too shabby. And uh, I was going to save it for next week, but um, um, 79 almost in a row. I know that uh, there have been a couple of weeks where we missed one or two, but uh, other than that, uh, it is absolutely awesome uh, to be here. I love doing the Saturday morning with show, uh, Saturday with Sam. Good morning, Mario. And uh, truly, it uh, just is I'm, I'm so happy to be able to provide the information to you guys, answering your questions and making sure that not only do you have the right information, but also that you have the right questions that you're asking to whichever entity you're going to. And hey, Sherry, good morning. And making sure that you have the right questions uh, so that you can get the right information from those people. Hey, good morning, Rose. So uh, this week I uh, had gotten a couple of really good questions uh, emailed to me and I wanted to address those first and then, um, and then jump into a, a quick topic at the end. One of the questions that got asked uh, was or had to do with uh, the importance of, of wages and how that can impact what someone receives when they first get hurt and um, thank you. And um, not only what they receive when they first get hurt, but also how their wages can affect what the value or the amount of money that somebody can receive. So I wanted to have a discussion in terms of being able to make sure that we understand how people get paid when they get hurt and also how it's important to make sure that you're keeping track of what the insurance companies are paying you because more and more we see that they aren't paying people correctly because they're getting wrong information from the employer. So let me explain. When someone gets hurt at work, by law in New Jersey, you are entitled to receive medical treatment. You get paid if you're out of work for more than seven days and then you're entitled to an award for your injury. Those are the three basic benefits that you get. Well, when you're out of work, because the doctor that they send you, uh, to send you to say that you cannot work or that you have light duty restrictions, but the employer can't accommodate those light duty restrictions, then you get paid what's called workers comp or it's called temporary disability, but you're getting paid from the workers comp insurance carrier. You get paid 70% of your gross weekly wage, okay? So that's, let's start there. It's 70% of your gross weekly wage. Now, how does the insurance company calculate what, set, what your gross weekly wage is? Well, what they do is they're supposed to look backwards in time, 26 weeks before your accident, add up the 26 weeks, divide by 26, and that gets to what your average weekly wage would be. Now, here's where it gets interesting. So what sometimes the insurance company likes to do is for some reason, if you, let's say, first of all, let's say you only work 20 weeks. Okay, so then they're only gonna take the 20 weeks that you worked, okay? So you don't have to worry, oh, they're doing zeros because uh, I didn't work 26 weeks. They're dividing by 26 weeks, so that's why it's low. No, if you only work 20 weeks, they're only gonna average the 20 weeks, so that's fine. But Sometimes what happens is two different things. One, if you work overtime, the employer might just tell the insurance company of your gross weekly wage and not include the overtime. Well, they don't get to do that. If you're working overtime, then they have to base your gross weekly wage on the amount of money that you're actually receiving week in and week out. So that's one way they try and screw you. The second thing that they do is let's say just as an example, you had a vacation or whatever and you weren't paid for the vacation. So there's a zero 
in the middle of all of these normal weeks, 500, 500, 500, zero, 500, 500, 500. They actually will include that zero in the midst and when they do the division, which would then obviously reduce what your monthly benefit, I mean, what your weekly benefit or weekly wage would be, which then when you do 70% of that makes it less. So what you want to do is if you're out of work and receiving workers' compensation, if they're paying you per week or if they're paying you every other week, you want to make sure that what you're getting is actually the 70% of what your true uh, weekly wage was, taking into consideration all of the overtime and whatnot. Now, one of the things that we do when there's really a funky issue is that we'll ask for what's called a 26-week wage statement. So then what happens is the insurance company's attorney will send me a printout or send me an email that's got what your weekly wages were going backwards before your accident. And then we cross-reference that against with our clients against what they're saying and what their records have, and then try and establish that they are or are not paying correctly. So that's one. Now, also interesting, if let's say you get hurt on a part-time job where you're only making, let's say, $200 a week, well, Workers' compensation in New Jersey says that if you get hurt, there is what they call a statutory minimum that workers' comp has to pay per week. So if, let's say, you're only making $200 a week, but you get hurt and now you're out of work, workers' compensation in 2019, I think it provides $249 per week in terms of the benefit that you can receive. So there's actually a statutory minimum that might be higher than what your actually gross weekly wage was. Morning, David. So that's a slight advantage. However, however, that's for the temporary disability or the worker's comp, which is the second benefit. But when you look at what the final benefit that you're going to receive, which is your award for your injury, those are based on what are called percentages of disability. Each percentage has a dollar value. So 5% equals X and 10% equals Y. And the higher the percentage, the greater the dollar. However, when it comes to those awards, they are also based on what your wages were. So if your wage was only $200 per week, 70% of that is $140. That is the most per week that you could get paid for your injury. So wages have a big effect on both the temporary disability of the workers' compensation benefit that you get when you get hurt originally, as well as the... Um, award that you might receive at the end of your case. So that's why knowing exactly how much you get paid and being able to calculate what those benefits are makes a huge difference uh, potentially in what you can get paid. Now, here is where it gets really fun. So, hey, good morning, Susan. Um, oh, that's terrible. I'm sorry. Um, so when, so when you are getting paid, let's say that you are only working 20 hours a week, but you're working in a job that potentially could be a full-time employment. So let's say you're working 20, make it easy math for me. <laughs> let's say you are working 20 hours a week and you're getting paid $15 an hour. So you're getting paid $300 a week. Now, however, you are in a job that you're only working 20 hours a week because the employer only wants to give you 20 hours a week, but now you've gotten hurt and now you can't work. Well, if your injury affects your ability to do employment, not only do you get paid workers' comp, but 
we, as the petitioner's attorney, as your lawyer, can argue that your gross weekly wage is not $300 a week, but we can reconstruct what's called reconstruct your wage. So your reconstructed wage would equal, um, what would that be? So 40, it would be 600 a week. See, I need the calculator. <laughs> um, it would be $600 a week, not 300. So you would not be receiving the, the minimum from workers comp or that 249, you would actually be receiving $420 a week because the wage can get reconstructed. Now I guarantee you, guarantee you, no insurance company is going to say, oh gee, it looks like we can reconstruct their wage and let's pay them more money. No, not gonna happen ever, ever. So if you're in a position where you're only working part-time, but it's in a job that potentially could be a full-time job, one of the issues that you want to be aware of is that your weekly wage may be reconstructed so that you can actually get paid more from temporary disability benefits for being out of work and also have it reconstructed for purposes of the award that you will eventually receive. So that's somewhat unique there. So, however, there are jobs that are just, you know, those jobs that aren't full-time jobs. As an example, just because it comes to my head, it would be like a bus aide or um, a school bus driver. Now, a school bus driver could be full-time because there are other jobs and other runs they can do. But the bus aide is like an example of like a part-time job. Um, school crossing guard is never going to be considered a full-time job. So that's not one that could get reconstructed. But if you're only hired and you're only working 25 hours a week as an office administrator or, you know, an administrative assistant, but that's a full-time or it could be a full-time job and you get hurt, then it can be argued that your wage can be reconstructed and so that you could get paid more money. Now, so that's on the wages. There's a question that's come up here uh, if, um, and I'm certainly sorry for your loss, but that if there is an issue that if you're receiving uh, workers comp or what are called dependency benefits, hey, good morning, Jack. Uh, if you're receiving dependency benefits, that is your uh, husband or wife who passed away as a result of a work accident, if you then receive uh, workers' comp or what are called dependency benefits, and you receive those for the rest of your life or until you were to be remarried. Um, at age 60, you're eligible for widow benefits. And no, there would be no impact on those two benefits at all. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, so the other issue that I wanted to talk to people about today is child support. And the reason that I wanted to just bring this up was because recently we were in court. And when we're going to court and we're getting ready to settle cases, we have access to the state's computer. So we can see whether or not there are any kind of state liens that are attached, oh, you're very welcome, uh, are attached to the particular case. So in other words, if let's say, um, um, uh, if let's say the, um, let's say the case was originally denied and hey Tim, good morning. And, uh, and, and so you're receiving um, state disability benefits. So workers comp denies the case. You then go and apply for state disability benefits and they pay you uh, while you're out of work. You go back to work. Now state disability, they want to get their money back. So they have a lien. Well, that ties to your worker's compensation case to make sure that they get paid back. So child support is another um, situation where the child support computer system talks directly to the worker's compensation computer system. So if somebody has child support arrears and they are settling a worker's compensation case, they can't put that worker's compensation case through unless the child support lien is satisfied. So as an example, 
if you're coming to court and you're going to get $15,000 as your award, if you have a $5,000 arrearage, well, that's going to get wiped out right out the gate and you're only then going to get $10,000. If you're going to get an award for $15,000, but there is a $50,000 child support lien, then you're going to get $2,000 and $13,000 is going to go towards the child support lien. So that's how it works. So basically, if you've got child support arrearage and you're going to receive money from workers' comp, if the arrearages are higher than the award, then the only thing you're going to receive is $2,000. That's statutory. That's not something that I or any other workers' comp attorney can negotiate. That is, I can't go to court and say, oh, well, listen, can you give them 5000 and the rest to child support? Now, it's statutory that there's a requirement that if the lien is higher than the amount of money you're getting, you're going to get $2,000 and the balance is going to go to uh, to the child support. Um, so, like I said, there's nothing that can get negotiated about that. That's just the way that is. So, um, so that was another uh, good question that had come up this week. And uh, I actually had that um, uh, this past week as well, um, talked to, about it with a client. And, you know, they recognize that the, the lien is what the lien is. And at least when they make that kind of or child support receives that kind of large payment, um, there's a recognition that, you know, the payment was made. And so the person uh, potentially avoids uh, the not nice nature of what happens when there are large child support arrears, which is the possibility of, of getting arrested and going to jail. So um, that being said, that's how the child support impacts on the workers' compensation uh, awards. So those are the two big issues that had sort of come up in question format. And the only other thing that I wanted to do today was sort of quickly revisit um, my a uh, deep dive from last uh, Saturday regarding the social security disability hearings. And one of the things that I wanted to give in terms of making sure that if you're going through that process, or if you know of somebody that's going through the process, to try and give a quick sort of tip, if you will. At, when you apply for a hearing in front of a judge, social security sends a form that asks if you want to have a video conference and they try and convince you that, well, if you do that, it's going to be quicker. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily true, but I would tell you that if you're given the option to have a live hearing or a video hearing, do not, do not do the video hearing. The reason for that, just real quick, is when we go to court, there's really two Mostly, there are two venues in the state of New Jersey where hearings are held. One is held in Pensacola, New Jersey, which is down by Camden. The other is held in Newark. Now, we've appeared, or I personally have appeared in front of Social Security judges now for 23 years. And when you're appearing in front of the same judges, then you know exactly how the hearing is going to go. You know the questions the judge is going to ask. You know the things that the judges are going to be concerned about. And you have a flavor of how you can help your client testify in front of any particular judge. That being said, when they do the video, you could randomly get a judge from Vermont or from Chicago or from Puerto Rico or wherever and there's no familiarity with that particular judge's nuance on how they're going to handle a claim. Now, the questions are pretty much standard, yes, and the hearings themselves are pretty much standard, yes. But in my opinion, there is nothing like having a familiarity with the particular judge to know that, look, this is the way the judge is going to ask the questions. This is what the judge is going to focus on. This is most important focus on this when you're testifying because that's what they're looking for. So in my opinion, if you are in that process or if in fact you know of somebody in that process and they are given the opportunity to get asked as to whether or not they want to um, 
have a live hearing or a video hearing, please make sure that they check off that they want a live or just say no to the fact of the um, of the um, of the um, um, video the video hearing. Just say no to the video hearing. Um, again, I don't think that it is a longer process. That is, I don't think that they, um, I don't think that they get to do that. So anyway, um, so that, um, okay, so let's see what else we got. There's a lawsuit that's going on. Da, 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 da. How this affect my workers' comp? I still have since it happened in New Jersey. Can I close both? Okay, right. Um, okay, so the, the question that has come up is, um, what happens, um, and I can get to that because that's actually pretty good. Um, what happens if you have a work accident for, uh, that happens while you're working and there's also what's called a third party case uh, or a personal injury lawsuit? The example I can give to you is if my job is to drive from A to B and while I'm doing my job driving from A to B, somebody hits me from behind. So not only do I have a worker's compensation case because I was driving from A to B, but I also have a personal injury lawsuit or what's called a third party lawsuit against the person that hits me. So I am the first party. My employer is the second party. And the person that has caused me to get hurt as a result of their negligence is the third party. So you can have a third party lawsuit because in New Jersey, it says, the law says you cannot sue your employer directly, okay? So, got it? So, A to B, I got my workers' comp case, I get hit from behind, I also have a lawsuit against the person that hits me. How do the things interact? Usually, workers' compensation goes first, and that's because of the system itself and how it plays out in the sense that the benefits, you get medical treatment, you get paid when you're out of work, you go back to work, the case settles. Workers' compensation pays X dollars. So for easy math, I'm going to say, hypothetically, let's say that bowl of benefits is $60,000, okay? So in medical treatment, in the money they paid for out of work, and the case settling, the insurance company, Workers' Comp, has paid $60,000. Okay. Now, here comes the personal injury lawsuit. And they usually do go slower. Uh, usually those cases take longer because of other things you have to prove that you don't have to prove in workers' compensation. So here comes the personal injury lawsuit. Now it's going to try and settle. So the first thing that has to happen out of that third-party lawsuit is the workers' compensation lien has to get paid back. Well, the lien is two thirds of what workers comp paid. So for easy math, like I said, $60,000 was paid in benefits. Two thirds of that is $40,000. $40,000 is the workers compensation lien. So when the personal injury lawsuit settles, that $40,000 has to get taken into consideration because it has to get paid back from the third party case. And then whatever's left is the money that you receive. And that's how the two interact. And uh, Susan, if you have any other questions on that, you can just sort of give me a buzz, no problem. And Brian asked, uh, if you missed one appointment, do they stop your workers comp? The answer is no. Uh, if, you are, if you miss an appointment, they should not stop your workers comp. Um, and in fact, uh, Obviously, we're dealing with that issue, but the reality is no. And then you go to the next appointment and the doctor still keeps you out of work. You now get paid and you should get paid all the way back to when you uh, first got hurt. And there should not be any kind of penalization because you missed uh, one appointment. So um, anyway, so that is our show for this morning. I am Sam Gaylord. I am managing partner at Gaylord Pop. I am also a disability litigator in the state of New Jersey, representing injured workers in the areas of workers' compensation. Oh, you're welcome. Workers' compensation, Social Security disability, and disability pension appeals. And uh, I just can't thank everybody enough. It was a great, uh, great morning. Uh, went super quick. A lot of good questions. And uh, if you have any more, please email me at sgaylord at gaylordpop.com, sgaylord at gaylordpop.com 
or give me a call 609-771-8611, 609-771-8611. Uh, you can go to the website, www.gaylordpop.com. Um, and certainly uh, there's a whole bunch of videos there. Um, so if you have any questions, you can um, take a look there. But I want to say thank you. Please make sure that if you've enjoyed this, you send me a like and you share this because basically this is good stuff. It's good information. It's accurate. And I know people are struggling out there with getting the right information on these topics. So if you don't mind sharing, that would be great. The more people that we get to, the more information that's out there that's accurate, um, the more people that I can help. So with that, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing everybody next Saturday morning, 9 a.m. Saturday with Sam. I'm Sam Gaylord, Managing Partner at Gaylord Pop, and I'm wishing everybody a happy and cool weekend. Stay cool, stay hydrated. Um, it's going to be brutal out there. Talk to you. Bye now.